Hello and a warm welcome to this NSF webinar on cleaning and cleaning validation, which is presented by myself, Dave Waddington. Before I run through the introductions and outline today's program for the webinar, I'd just like to say I'm surprised by the popularity this subject continues to have. I last presented on this topic back in June of this year to the NSF alumni meeting, which was held here in York. And that meeting generated a huge number of follow-up questions and interest in the subject, which um, I was quite surprised by. And similarly today, we've got 135 participants on the line um, from around the world, so we're globally represented today. So thank you for all taking your time out and joining me for this webinar. With that in mind, um, we've muted the lines for today's call to ensure smooth running. And unfortunately, we won't be able to have any follow-up questions during the actual webinar itself. But if you do have any questions, then I'll provide you with an email address and a link at the end of the session so you can contact me directly. Starting off with a few introductions. Most of you will be familiar with NSF Pharma. We're a leading GMP consultancy, and we deal with training, both external training, public courses, and internal training. We also provide auditing services and consultancy services. But I won't dwell too much on um, our offerings. So an introduction to myself. Hopefully, many of you on the line will know me. I'm Dave Waddington, I'm a director here at NSF Health Sciences. I joined NSF just over two years ago, back in July 2017. And I'm pleased to say today is my first ever webinar for NSF, so it's a new first for me, which I'm really excited by. Just a bit of background about me. I'm a chemist. I've worked in the pharmaceutical industry since 1986. I'm also a qualified person, and you'll see there listed below some of the areas of uh, my sort of interest and expertise. Cleaning validations, one of those areas which has really followed through with my career. So back in my early days of working as an analytical development scientist with, as it was, Beecham Pharmaceuticals, who became Smith Klein Beecham. I worked in a group that supported new product introduction. And as part of that operation, we looked at each of the new compounds into our facility, and we established cleaning procedures for them and carried out some of the, the evaluations to make sure those products were safely cleaned off of our equipment. The interesting thing about today's presentation, and as I reflect from when I presented before at the QP alumni meeting, is a lot of the issues I'll be running through today from what the regulators are seeing are actually nothing new. They're not new issues that um, have come about because of more recent changes. A lot of the issues we're still seeing are some of the basic challenges and basic issues around cleaning validation. So looking at the content of today's webinar, when trying to set up a program, I was looking at options for the ways I could present this. And one of them would be to simply run through what are the current European, US, and maybe PICS requirements for cleaning and cleaning validation. And whilst that would be interesting, I thought it would be more interesting to actually see, well, what are the regulatory observations that are coming up at the moment that continue to hit industry? So therefore, they're continuing to present us with a bit of a challenge. So I've taken a look through some recent findings on basic cleaning issues, both from the European and the US perspective, and taken those from the publicly available information. Now, one health warning here is that that information is often redacted and restricted, and we're only seeing, if you like, worst case reports from warning letters or European non-compliance reports. Having said that, it still builds an interesting picture and pattern. I will then, for those of you that are fairly new to the subject, also reflect on the changes, particularly to the European guidance, the GMP guidance that happened a few years ago, and particularly the changes to chapters 3 and 5 in Annex 15, and just answer a few questions around that. 
And then finally, I'll just reflect on what I'm calling QP considerations, but they're really sort of quality considerations around cleaning validation and cleaning validation programs. At the very end of the presentation, and this webinar will be made available um, on the NSF portal, I've pulled together several pages of references and guidances, which for any of you which want to look at uh, further reading, it uh, will hopefully give you a good source of reference there. So let's have a look at the sources of data that I've used. So I've actually trawled through 20 months' worth of data, which runs from January 2018 to August 2019. And I've looked, as mentioned earlier, at two key sets of information. So this is looking at the UDRA, GMDP non-compliance report, and the FDA warning letters. And out of the European reports, there were 22 reports published over that period and 12 of them include um, areas relating to cleaning and cross-contamination. And similarly with the FDA warning letters, 79 reports published and 20 directly relate to cleaning and cross-contamination. So often these reports are where companies have multiple issues, so they maybe have uh, receiving up to, particularly European ones, up to 20 or 30 observations. But Cleaning does feature in quite a number of those where there is deemed to be sort of lack of overall control within the PQS. What I'll run through now is looking at the European and US observations and actually break it down into API and drug product and just give a profile of where the observations were seen and the types of products it's associated with. So on each of these tables I'll present, you'll see the authority, um, which is on the left-hand side there, and these are obviously European inspections, and the site locations. So where we're looking at APIs, it's not surprising that a large number of the observations are in China and India, and that's driven by the fact that the majority of the inspections are in China and India. The interesting area to me is on the material classifications. So some of the recent findings around APIs tend to focus more on those potent uh, materials, uh, those beta-lactam antibiotic type products. So two-thirds of the observations or the findings there have been around chemically potent or may cause sort of those special compounds. And here, if we look at the actual observations that were raised, and as I said earlier, the, these are quite restricted information, so it doesn't go into too much of detail, but I've certainly picked out the highlights. And what we can see at the top here is two key observations where the handling of mixtures of materials, in particular here the APIs, where we have cytotoxic, hazardous, highly potent, and non-cytotoxic, so you've got a right mix of different APIs being produced in the same facility. The observation here is that the risks weren't properly identified and mitigated. So the organization involved didn't take a step back, look at the types of materials and processes, and figure out through a quality risk management process what the right controls required within their facility. Interesting, the second observation, and this is a real reoccurring theme as we run through the observations, is that cleaning validation simply wasn't completed. And in this instance, for compounds of high pharmacological activity, so those materials that we would have um, a big concern about, and cleaning validation wasn't even considered. The middle group of observations there, I won't go into in too much detail, but you'll see as we run through the slides, the fairly common types of observations. But I will draw your attention, since this relates to APIs, to the bottom observation, where this particular one was a risk of contamination related to reusable material containers. And this is a reminder that our cleaning validation studies shouldn't only look at our fixed or maybe portable equipment in the facilities, that define our process chains, but it also should look at those materials which may be sort of transient within the process. So containers, scoops, etc. within our processes. 
So moving on to our drug products, and we'll see here again, we have uh, six observations, and of those observations, not surprisingly with drug products, a number of those were domestic European inspections, so UK, Italy, and Spain, and three of them are in India. And if we look at our dose form types, it covers all different dose form types. So we have observations raised against liquids, solids, tablets and capsules, micro pellets, and as well as potent and hormone products, we also had observations raised around veterinary products as well. And if we look now in detail at those recent findings, again, the top observation is very much about our organizational measures to prevent cross-contamination. So the whole program here was deemed at such a risk in this particular organization that the products themselves presented a risk to public health. And not surprisingly, this was raised as a critical observation. And again, if we look at the observations lower down that list, uh, fairly common observations that we'll see across all of these inspection areas, but also some fairly basic GMP requirements. So at the bottom there, you'll see there's an absence of records for cleaning. So in that particular organization, um, they didn't have uh, any sufficient documentation, any logbooks, or any sort of individual batch changeover forms to prove that cleaning had indeed taken place. Now moving over to the US and looking at FDA warning letters. And overall, we had 21 of these, of which are split into drug products and API. And one of the sites had both drug product and API, which is why the numbers don't appear to quite tally. But in terms of the split of the warning letters, nine relate to APIs and 12 relate to drug product sites. And again, you'll see um, a high focus with the APIs on China and India, where four each um, in each location there. And one of those warning letters was issued to uh, a site in Canada. Drug product, again, split quite heavily, a big focus on China and India, but also quite a number of other countries represented there, Canada, France, Singapore, Korea, Turkey, etc. So just looking through the observations again, and what you'll see here is the observations that the, the US are finding and reporting within the warning letters are very, very similar to the observations which are seen from a European perspective. So that the top observation here is, and I, I do like this observation, that cleaning cannot substitute for proper segregation. And this observation was highlighted at an API repacking organization who were taking materials in and they were repacking and relabeling those materials. And they had um, a, quite a wide ranging mixture of materials they were handling, running from um, some potent sensitizing materials through to some fairly standard APIs. And it's that high level reminder that if we are dealing with uh, potent or sensitizing materials, we have got to look at appropriate containment and we have to design our facilities with the appropriate segregation and maybe even separate facilities are required for certain operations. The next two observations are quite interesting. And this is where companies actually uh, put in place cleaning validation programs and actually had quite good evidence of um, carrying out um, cleaning validation studies. However, when they set up their programs, they didn't take a step back and think about the total manufacturing chain or all the pieces of equipment which were involved in these processes. So for example, the third observation down, the organization selected an API for the cleaning validation studies, which was fine. It was the worst case. It was the hardest to clean. But unfortunately, that particular material used 11 pieces of production equipment out of a total of 16 pieces of production equipment. 
and the other five pieces of production equipment we use for other products and other processes. So what the company didn't do here is look at, okay, well in those five additional pieces of equipment, what were the next worst case materials that run through them and how should we evaluate those from a cleaning validation perspective? So I guess it's a reminder here that where we use science and sort of risk-based approaches to look at our worst case scenarios, we still do have to look at the different equipment types, different equipment used within our processes, maybe different contact surfaces, and figure out which are the best materials to challenge those with to make sure the cleaning process is adequate. The fourth observation down here is also an interesting one where the organization used uh, multiple different solvents and those solvents were used in the, the cleaning processes themselves as uh, the cleaning materials. But what the organization didn't look at is the potential for solvent carryover from one drug product to another. So for example, if you have um, a higher risk solvent, then they would look for the residue of maybe an API or a process intermediate within the solvent, but they wouldn't necessarily look for the solvent residues themselves. So again, for any of you involved in APIs or auditing APIs, it's another interesting area to look at. So looking um, at a few other observations relating to APIs, the, the top observation here is just a fairly basic requirement of validation, that uh, this particular organization were carrying out their cleaning validation studies, which were subsequently reported. And I don't believe there were too many issues with the subsequent report. But in this instance, they actually shipped and supplied the product to the US market before actually completing the full validation study and reporting the data. So they didn't have appropriate controls over the validation process itself to prevent batches of product being released into the US market. The next observation is fairly familiar to the one I highlighted in the, the European um, observations where cleaning was simply not documented between runs. So some fairly basic observations been highlighted here. As, um, the observations at the bottom where equipment tagged as clean, even though it was pretty obvious from visual examination of the equipment that it was encrusted with residue. So it's looking at the appropriateness of the cleaning process and what checks are put in place and how thorough are those checks. And the, the bottom observation is fairly similar there, where material residue was observed in the bottom of a vessel which was reported to be clean. So some fairly basic GMP failures there. If we look at uh, the drug product and some observations that were found in warning letters here, top one's an interesting one. So cross-contamination measures associated with beta-lactam penicillins and this particular organization did have segregated separate facilities, but they still within their facilities had some common services or common personnel who moved between those facilities. And it was really a lack of controls here that were placed over the movement of people and materials between those two facilities, even though they were based about uh, a quarter of a mile apart from each other. The bottom observation is uh, an interesting one because this relates now to residual disinfectants. And again, similar to talking about uh, residual solvents, the cleaning validation program shouldn't just focus on the API or process intermediate or drug product. We also use cleaning aids, one of which may be disinfectant. And in this particular instance, the HPLC chromatograms for those residual defectants showed significant peaks. And they were similar to the cleaning agent, but a failure investigation wasn't carried out. 
So the company didn't recognize the fact that these peaks could have been the disinfectant and didn't quantify it and take it forward sufficiently. The final observation highlighted here is quite a comprehensive one. And again, I think when you look through this observation, it really just shows a lack of forethought on how we are going to design our cleaning validation studies. The organization involved had continued to manufacture um, despite have not having appropriate studies in place. The cleaning and disinfectant uh, challenges or checks were limited to visual examination only, so there was no residual chemical determination applied. And it didn't actually document appropriately the cleaning method and the cleaning protocol and the cleaning validation protocol. So what were the rinse times? What were the hold times of equipment prior to um, switching over? And a fairly basic one, um, which keeps on being reported, is where results fail specification, so they're higher than the acceptance limits, and either that failure isn't recognized, so there's no investigation carried out, or it's just not commented on or not appropriately commented on. So where a limit is failed and the justification is, well, it's acceptable with a poor scientific justification for why it's acceptable. And in particular, this type of comprehensive observation on a warning letter has led the FDA in those warning letters to provide industry with some help. And it's quite interesting this, and I want to draw your attention to it, that if, you're ever, if you ever find yourself in an unfortunate position where you do have observations raised about your um, cleaning approach or your cleaning validation program, and you have maybe a, a major observation or a 483 raised against your organization, on the FDA's website under Freedom of Information, the warning letters themselves do actually contain almost a prescriptive program for the actions you should take to mitigate the issues observed. And these are really, really helpful because they're almost like a, um, a script for industry. And if you're interested in this area and you look at warning letters related to maybe data integrity issues or failures of CAPA programs, failures of investigation, failure of process validation, or in this instance, cleaning validation, you'll see in these warning letters the FDA make suggestions on what organizations should do to provide the appropriate amount of information and control. And I won't run through this in detail, but I've shared with you here an example of a drug substance one, and then also a drug product one. And you'll see in the middle of this those four highlighted bullets where the FDA are actually highlighting to the organization if you want to conduct a um, worst case cleaning program, then these are the four areas you should really include. It shouldn't be just limited to those, but they're four good starting points. So you should evaluate drugs of the highest toxicity, the lowest solubility in their cleaning solvents, evaluate drugs with characteristics that make them very difficult to clean, so those hardest to remove off the different services, and make sure you're looking at locations that aren't just the most accessible, but are actually those which are difficult to clean. So the FDA are very good across all those different areas in warning letters of helping organizations to frame and structure their response to actually get themselves back out of a problem. So that covers really the review of the FDA and the European observations. As I said, it's a bit of a health warning there that these really do relate to those organizations that have had warning letters or serious observations raised. But I think it gives a fairly good flavor. And to me, continually, the biggest surprise is a lot of those observations are just 
basic failures in GMP. So now we move on to look at a reminder. So hopefully all of you will be very familiar with this, but some of you new to the subject, I just thought I'd uh, run through a quick reminder of some of the more recent changes relating to cleaning and cleaning validation. So within Europe, chapters three and five were revised uh, three, four years ago, and those revisions were implemented in March 2015. And accompanying that, Annex 15 on validation was implemented in October 2015, and Annex 15 section within it on cleaning validation incorporated some of the changing requirements that were seen in chapters three and five. And all of those changes were very much focused on providing a risk-based approach to validation and controlling cleaning. And it introduced the concept of dedicated facilities and setting cleaning validation limits based upon something which is more scientifically based, so a toxicological evaluation. And accompanying that, the EMA issued their guidance on setting health-based exposure limits, the HBELs, and they were implemented in June 2015. So, the EMA then, following quite a lot of industry feedback and a couple of years of discussion between industry and the regulators on the most appropriate way to implement these requirements, the EMA issued um, a Q&A document. The draft was published in January 2017, and the final version after some amendments was published in April 2018. The, for those of you that remember this and were involved, the original draft introduced the concept of highly hazardous products and substances, and this was found not to really add too much value, so that was then removed from the final guidance. So health-based exposure limits, how are those used within our cleaning validation programs? And this concept is looking at the concept of a continuous scale of hazard. And you can see the diagram there looking at um, exposure levels on the left-hand side where we're looking at greater than 10,000 micrograms today. So it's fairly low potent material running across to the right-hand side where we're running towards the red color where we're looking at less than 10 micrograms per day which is looking at permitted daily exposure of quite, quite a low level. And the concept of this continuous scale is really looking at the principle of there aren't really any cutoff points where once you hit a certain level, you have to take the following actions. What it introduces in terms of a concept is organizations for each of their materials should understand the hazards associated with them and then implement the most appropriate organizational, technical, and procedural controls that are suitable for those particular materials that have been handled. And those controls would look at, at the um, top end, having dedicated facilities, segregated facilities, running through to containment, closed systems, maybe disposables, which um, remove the need for cleaning, and then looking at appropriate cleaning regimes within multi-product facilities. And there's a reminder here that the cleaning limits shouldn't be set at necessarily the calculator's health-based exposure limit. So one of the things we found in industry from looking at um, our materials and calculating the limits, all of a sudden the health-based exposure limit was a lot higher than the limits we traditionally developed from the one one thousandth calculation, that non-scientific calculation that had been used for many, many years. And the health-based exposure limits is really highlighted. It goes beyond setting those limits. It's that reminder back to the the sort of rainbow, orange, yellow, orange to red chart we saw earlier that we're supposed to be looking at quality risk management principles in terms of applying the most important or most appropriate control criteria. 
So if our cleaning processes can achieve a lot lower limit, then there's no problem in setting a lower limit and using those limits we've historically used for cleaning processes, they should and can be retained, and they can be considered as alert limits. Now, I guess one health warning here is if we continually exceed those alert limits, as with any limits, then it shows our processes may not be under control. And as a consequence, we should look at putting in place improvements to make sure we meet those limits on a regular basis. So, of course, where we do exceed an alert limit, which can be a limit set between the health-based exposure limit or at the health-based exposure limit and a lower limit, then if we fail that limit, then we should obviously investigate, document, and put in place corrective actions. So just taking a bit of a step back, and it's one of the questions that's been asked on quite a number of occasions, is why did we actually need this new guidance in the first place? And I think one of the challenges, if you sort of wind the clock back 10 years ago, is the guidance that was in place at the time may actually have been quite restrictive in some cases. And residual levels were calculated on a nominal calculation of 1 1,000th, and it didn't really take into account the toxicological and pharmacological nature of the materials we were dealing with. That's really important where we have a material which can be a sensitizing type material um, or a cytotoxic. And some, some of those materials may historically have unreasonably been forced into dedicated facilities when actually there are other approaches in terms of containment which are quite appropriate and successful to use. And of course, we have a whole other area here looking at IMPs and how we deal with IMP products. So as mentioned, the new guidance did bring in a science-based approach to setting our limits, and that was based on the permitted daily exposure or health-based exposure limit. And that limit takes into account the not only the nature of the material, but also the administration route. So if you're dealing with the a same API in a facility, where you may have, um, for example, creams and ointments or liquids and a solid dose product and an injectable product, you could have different limits set according to those different formulations and processes and routes of administration. So the final area I'm going to look at, I've called it um, QP considerations, but this should really be just looking at the general quality considerations. And what are the areas which um, the, I guess the agencies are seeing where we trip ourselves up in industry? And Graham McKilligan from the MHRA wrote a really good article on this, which I've referenced later um, and published it as a blog in October 2018, just looking at some of the basic areas where the MHRA are picking up organizations within their inspections. And one of the key con QP considerations is taking that step back from your facility, and this is either your own facility or a facility that you're going to audit, and really looking at the appropriate use of quality risk management. Now, has quality risk management been used to justify what you have in place, or has quality risk management been used as a blank piece of paper a fresh look at the way your controls have been put in place, how your facility has been designed and segregated. And that's a really important differentiation, and a lot of organizations struggle with that. And the second point there, not making assumptions the current controls work. It's really, really important when looking at cleaning and cleaning validation programs to actually get down to the area to look at those API vessels, to look at those tablet manufacturing processes, and seeing how the current cleaning and segregation and people and behavior controls actually work within those areas. 
and organizations often find, and we'll see um, back to some of those observations, of seeing material encrusted on maybe difficult to clean, difficult to see areas of equipment. So that's a key message. Get off your chairs, get out of your offices, and go into the facility to look at how well your cleaning methods are working. And again, the next observations there or considerations are linked to quality risk management and being careful of using FMEA-style risk assessments to justify what you currently have in place. It's fine using those risk-style assessments, but make sure they're challenging what you have in place rather than just justifying what you have in place. And obviously, the results of these um, assessments, the QRM program, should actually determine the organizational technical measures that we need to put into place. And quite often, the agencies are seeing that cleaning validation is not supported by sound science. And some of those areas of failure are areas like not dismantling all parts of equipment that need to be dismantled. So not breaking the equipment down, removing seals, cleaning those areas, and checking them before reassembling those particular pieces of equipment. One big area of discussion and debate is looking at some of those key variables for the cleaning process itself, particularly where we have manual cleaning and looking at the reproducibility day-to-day um, -day between different operators over a prolonged period of time for those cleaning processes. And also, as organizations, do we do a three-clean study Maybe we're good and do a five clean study on our cleaning validation program and then say, that's it, the cleaning procedures work, the residues are down to an appropriate level, and we'll now never reassess cleaning. So what do we need to do as we do each product changeover to show that the cleaning has been effective? Is it just visual examination or do we need to do some sampling and testing? That really brings me to my sort of final summary of the common issues. And as I said at the start, a lot of these issues have been very common now within our industry since the 1990s. So the key observation here and the key finding and certainly where organizations get themselves into the most hot water is our basic facility design and its operation to pre prevent cross-contamination. Obviously, cleaning validation, the inadequacy of the process, but a lot of it is down to lack of documentation, be it um, in-process cleaning tags or cleaning records, cleaning logs, and looking at evidence by the contamination we actually see in the facility itself. So there are some of the common issues. Now, I did promise at the beginning I will provide you with a number of references. So here they are. I'm not going to run through these in detail, but here's the references to the updated European guidance. We have references to the um, Q&A papers, and in particular the one at the bottom there, the cross-contamination control and Hebel um, Q&As posted by Graham McKilligan in October 2018. You should be able to find these quite easy with a Google search. If you need links, I can provide those for you. The next set of references, um, the fourth one down there, there's a good reference of PICS aid memoir on cross-contamination in shared facilities. In general, the PICS aid memoirs, if you're ever designing or auditing facilities, are fantastic documents, some really good checklists and things to consider. And the final set of references there at the top is the ISPI risk map document, which actually was fundamental in forming some of the current changes that we have seen within Europe. So they underpin the changes um, that were implemented in 2015. So that concludes my run through um, what the regulators check for when clean, auditing cleaning and cleaning validation. I hope you found that useful. Here's a list of further webinars we'll be running this year. And if you keep your eyes peeled, very shortly we'll be issuing our program for 2020.
So the next webinars coming up, we have Peter Goff presenting in October on the UK qualified person. Lynn Bias in November will be looking at key topics on packaging facilities. Then Martin Lush will conclude our program for the year looking at resolving conflict in multinational organizations, which should be an interesting listen. So thank you once again for attending today's webinar. If you do have any questions, then please do email in to me. You can email in to me on my um, direct email address, which is dwaddington, all one word, at nsf.org. We do also have other resources available. We have e-learning programs available on cleaning validation or cleaning qualification, which is a multi-module approach if you want some in-house training. And we do have a very good resources library, which has a number of links to cleaning validation. So I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule today and um, joining me in this discussion. And as I say, if you have any questions at all or any comments, then please do email in to me. Bye for now.